Ketzbook here, and today we're going to be looking at nuclear power. We're going to try to gain a basic understanding of how nuclear power plants work and also look at how different types of nuclear power plants are different. So let's jump right into it. All right, this is your basic diagram of a nuclear power plant, the most common nuclear power plant there is, and this is a pressurized light water reactor. And so let's see what's going on here. In the red, orange, yellow loop here, basically this is your core of the reactor. This right here is the central core. This is where you have your radioactive material. And that radioactive, radioactive material is used in order to generate heat, generates a lot of energy and a lot of heat from the nuclear fission. Okay, In all the nuclear power plants that we have with existing technology, they all use nuclear fission. And so that heat basically is taken out here and it is used to heat up and boil this water. The water turns into steam and the steam expands and moves very quickly and is able to spin a turbine. The turbine is connected to a generator that is got some magnets and wires in there and those spinning magnets and wires generate electricity and that electricity is used to power a number of different things. So that's your basic power plant. And all of this other stuff here, the water, the turbine, the generator, this stuff is going to be common to pretty much any kind of power plant, whether it's a nuclear power plant, a coal burning power plant, or an oil burning power plant, those parts are going to be more or less the same. Now you can have variations. You don't necessarily have to use water. You can use heated gas to spin a turbine, but the general principles are basically the same. Over here, you have a third loop of water, and that water might come from the ocean, might come from a stream or, or a river, and that's essentially used to remove excess heat. Because this is isolated, you're not going to get any kind of pollution other than heat pollution from this new, this new any kind of power plant with this loop. So this loop might be connected to a water source. Okay, So we want to basically focus on the reactor vessel itself and look at the different components and compare these to different types of nuclear power plants. So this is your pressurized um, light water reactor. Let's look at a boiling water reactor, which is going to be similar, but have a little bit of a difference here. Notice that in this pressurized water reactor, you have a sealed loop. So all of the water or whatever this material is that's touching this uh, nuclear reactor core is isolated from the turbine generator and all the rest of the nuclear reactor. So it's isolated in this closed loop. That's not the case for a boiling water reactor. A boiling water reactor is got an open loop. So here is your, your fuel elements, whether that is uranium, plutonium, or whatever. These things are heating up. They're doing nuclear fission. And as they're heating up, is taking this water here and is causing it to boil, generate steam, and that steam is used to spin the turbine. The very same water that touches the fuel elements is also going to be in contact with the turbine. So that might be a concern in terms of contamination. And it also means that your turbine is going to probably degrade faster than in your previous case where you have an isolated nuclear loop here and this water is not at all in contact so this water for the second loop here is not at all in contact with any of your radioactive materials so your boiling water reactor although it's probably simpler and cheaper to build is not as efficient and it's also not going to be as good in terms of safety issues and degradation of your turbine all right so Let's try to look a little bit more in detail now what exactly is going on inside this reactor core, okay? So inside that reactor core, first of all, you have your fuel rods. Without them, nothing's going to happen, right? Your fuel rods are typically made out of uranium oxide, but there's other things that you can use too. So your uranium oxide is put inside these rods with other different materials in addition to that and they're primarily going to be undergoing nuclear fission. All of your current technology nuclear power plants are fission-based. 
there is some research going on trying to create new fusion-based nuclear power plants, but none of them so far are actually able to be commercially used, okay? So here's your, your fission um, that's going to be going on inside your reactor core, typically going to be uranium-235 or possibly, um, let's say, thorium or your plutonium, okay? What they're going to be doing is they're going to be giving off neutrons. Now, this uranium is slightly enriched, but it's not going to be enriched to the point at which you can have any kind of nuclear explosion, okay? You're never going to reach criticality and have a nuclear explosion going on inside their nu your nuclear power plant, okay? Instead, what's happening is that these uraniums are going to be always giving off neutrons as they undergo fission and also giving off heat that's absorbed by the water. Now, the water is going to be doing two things. It's going to be both used as a coolant and as a moderator. Now, first of all, what in the world does that mean? It's a coolant, right? Why are we cooling down the reactor core? Don't we want to generate heat? And the answer is yes, we want to generate heat. So the term coolant is kind of a misnomer. It's not really what's going on. The water that's cooling down the uranium that's reacting is actually used as a heat transfer agent. So if we come back over here, basically there is water in this orange loop and that water is used to remove heat from the uranium and move it over to here. So really water is being used as a coolant. It's essentially that coolant means it's a heat transfer agent. So it's moving the heat into somewhere else in the power plant. Now, what about the term moderator? What does that mean? Moderator is super important for your nuclear power plant. Basically, a moderator is something that slows down your neutrons, okay? So a moderator is going to slow neutrons. And why would you want to slow a neutron? You want to slow down neutrons because the speed of the neutron affects how efficiently your uh, nuclear fission is going to take place, okay? So when you have a slow or thermal neutron, thermal basically means that it's going at, you know, speeds relative to the temperature that, you know, the reactor core is at. So if you have a thermal or slow neutron, when it bumps into a uranium-235, that collision is very, very likely to generate nuclear fission. However, if you have fast neutrons, neutrons that are going super, super fast, when they bump into uranium-235, they very likely will not create nuclear fission. They might do something else or they might do nothing at all. So your moderator basically makes nuclear fission happen more quickly. A moderator is going to be used to improve the speed of nuclear fission by slowing down the neutrons and making the nuclear fission more likely to occur. So water is actually a very good moderator. Now, control rods, what are these things? You, you'll see control rods, so we go back over here, you'll see control rods right here that can be lowered into your nuclear reactor or removed from them. The control rods are an extra measure of control to whether either speed up or slow down the nuclear reactor. Okay, basically control rods do what? They absorb neutrons. And when you absorb neutrons, you are going to be removing neutrons from the reaction and you're going to have less fission events. So you don't want to have to do this. You'd like to have a great temperature and speed of the reaction on its own. But if you have to, you can lower these control rods down into the reactor vessel. And when they are put in there, they take the place of the moderator. And now rather than slowing down neutrons, now they simply absorb the neutrons and they remove them from the reaction. So you reduce the number of nuclear fissions that are possible. Control rods can be made of a number of different materials. Boron, um, silver, iridium, cadmium are typically used or some sort of mixture of uh, two or more of those can be used in your control rods, okay? And you have active control over this. So you have to actively put them down or pull them out, okay? If you lose power, you might have problems there 
but hopefully your nuclear power plant would have something in place where if you lose power in the nuclear power plant, then these would automatically fall down in order to slow down the reaction. Okay. Um, what you the, Another type of nuclear power plant is the heavy water reactor. Now, heavy water reactors, well, what are heavy water reactors? Heavy water reactors, instead of having ordinary water, which the other reactor that we talked about does use ordinary water, they have heavy water. Now, what in the world is heavy water? Heavy water is actually heavier or more dense than normal water because all of the hydrogen or most of the hydrogen in the heavy water is replaced by deuterium, which you use the letter D, but it's still the same element. Deuterium is really just an isotope of hydrogen, and the only difference is that it has a neutron, whereas regular hydrogen is simply a single proton, right? And so we see we have an atomic number of one, mass number of one, regular hydrogen has zero neutrons. Deuterium, on the other hand, has one neutron and one proton, so it's a mass number of two. And so it's going to increase the mass, increase of increase the mass of one water, which increases the density of water in general. And so that heavy water is can be used in nuclear power plants. And so in your heavy water reactor, use mostly heavy water as the moderator. Now it turns out that heavy water or deuterium is perhaps one of the absolute best moderators. And so because you use such a good moderator, the, what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is in a heavy water reactor, you do not need enriched uranium. You can simply use ordinary uranium in a heavy water reactor because the moderator is so good, it slows down the neutrons so efficiently that all those neutrons are going to be captured by the uranium-235 and that is going to be fissioned. So your heavy water reactor works in exactly the same way, except the moderator is better, which causes you to have um, more nuclear fission events. And it means that you don't need to enrich your uranium. Okay. Now, in addition to these types of nuclear power plants, you also have things that can be causing breeding. Now, what is breeding? Now, so far we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about fission. So fission is the main thing that happens in your nuclear power plants, right? So fission is the main thing that happens in your nuclear power plants, but also you can have breeding occur. And what does breeding do? Breeding is basically taking some kind of nuclear fuel and increasing the amount of fuel that you have as the reaction goes. So as the reaction goes, you're actually increasing the amount of nuclear fuel you have. Well, how is that even possible? Remember, your nuclear fuel in a nuclear power plant is typically uranium, and that's going to be mostly uranium-238. Well, uranium-238 doesn't really undergo nuclear fission very well. So what happens is in your nuclear power plant, if you create breeding, you can take that unusable uranium-238 and have it absorb some neutrons, and then through a series of beta decays, it's going to turn into plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 is very good at undergoing fission. So as the reaction goes on, you actually enrich or increase the amount of fuel or fissionable fuel that you have in the reactor. And your breeder reactors can be extremely efficient that way, right? They're extremely efficient in terms of using more of that nuclear energy that is in your material. And if you increase the efficiency, you're also going to decrease the amount of nuclear waste produced, right? So nuclear waste is all that kind of extra junk that is radioactive, but you can't use. But breeding has the capability of taking those unusable radioactive materials and turning them into usable fuels and continuing to burn them. If you can set this thing up in an efficient way and continue to, to take fuel and burn it and continue to use all of those, whatever they are, those, those radioactive waste materials and continue to burn them in an efficient way, 
then you're able to both create more electricity and have less nuclear waste, which is what you want. Ideally, you want a nuclear power plant that has zero waste and uses up all of the nuclear energy. And breeding is one way to do that. All right, so here's a look at a sodium-cooled liquid metal reactor. A sodium-cooled, basically, what's the difference? So sodium is a poor moderator. Because sodium is a poor moderator, it's able to do breeding much more efficiently. Remember, good moderators create thermal neutrons, and thermal neutrons are good for creating fission of uranium-235. Your fast neutrons are not very good at creating fission, but they are good for breeding, and you can use them for breeding uranium-238 to turn into plutonium-239. So, sodium is a bad moderator. It's still a moderator, and it still is a coolant or heat transfer agent, but it's not as good at slowing down the neutrons. It does slow them down somewhat, and then you can create breeding. So the setup is more or less the same. Is This is just a different kind of picture looking at it, but you still have your reactor core. Inside your reactor, reactor core, you have both breeding and nuclear fission going on. The fission generates the heat, and the heat is transferred over into some other place here where you now have water or some gas that expands, spins a turbine, and creates electricity, okay? Now, sodium-cooled liquid metal reactors are more efficient, but they generate plutonium, which is good if you want to use plutonium in your reactor, and it's also very good if you want to use this plutonium to create a nuclear bomb. Remember, plutonium-239 is the most common material used in a nuclear fission bomb. So they're great if you want to make nuclear bombs out of them. However, if you want to make sure that no terrorist gets a hold of your nuclear power plant and uses it for nefarious reasons, then you probably don't want to be breeding uranium-238 to plutonium-239. But there is another alternative for breeding, and that is known as the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. Um, and now this, as far as I know, nobody has actually done this on a large scale. It has been done on a small scale, but I don't think there's any um, currently used commercial liquid, fluorium, liquid fluoride thorium reactors that are out there. But this technology is available. We, we know the technology. It's known technology, but it's just not being used for various reasons. So what's going on in this thing? In this thing, rather than using uranium, you're using thorium. So thorium is kind of the, the main, you know, kind of the main thing here of, of why this is so neat and so unique. Thorium itself is not fissionable, but thorium can breed. And when it breeds, it turns into uranium 235. So I don't have that written down here. But when um, when thorium breeds, it's going to turn into uranium 235. And that uranium 235 is what's fissionable. Now, uranium 235 is fissionable in a nuclear power plant, but it cannot possibly be used in a nuclear bomb. It's not good for nuclear bombs. It is, however, good for nuclear power plants. So thorium is a very abundant element. We have plenty of thorium. In fact, we have so much thorium that we could use this, you know, all the way up with our current electricity usages throughout the world and even more. And it's going to last us um, until well past our sun becomes a red giant and destroys the earth. So there's more than enough thorium on earth forever, essentially. Okay. And that thorium is based on essentially breeding that thorium, turning it into uranium-235, which is going to be able to fission inside this reactor core. Now, there's some other neat aspects of your liquid fluoride thorium reactor. And the first is that rather than having a solid fuel, you have a liquid fuel. And that liquid fuel itself is able to move and transfer the heat. Now, that liquid fuel is, is interesting also in terms of safety, and, and what do I mean by that? When that, if there was any problem with this reactor itself, you 
that liquid fuel would all drain out into a drain tank and be safely stored underground somewhere in some sort of emergency dump tank. Okay. Well, how's this work? Rather than it being an active safety, this is a passive safety. What do I mean? So you have some sort of cork or some sort of stop right here, and you have something that's that's frozen, and that frozen thing is being all you know all the time is being cooled, right? But if you lose power, that cooling is going to stop, and this cork or whatever you have here is going to melt, and all that liquid fuel is going to dump down, and there's going to be all of the radioactive material is going to be contained in some sort of dump tank. So it's a passive safety. And that passive safety means even if there is an earthquake, even if we have a tsunami, even if we have all power lost, you can still remove all of the radioactive material and keep it safely stored somewhere underground. Okay. Now, otherwise, this is fairly similar to your other power plants you are going to have a much greater efficiency from your liquid fluoride thorium reactors because you're going to remove much, much more of the nuclear energy from the thorium, which in addition to increasing the efficiency, you're also going to now reduce the amount of nuclear waste you produce. In fact, thorium is better than uranium breeding in terms of it's going to have fewer um, of those unusable nuclear or radioactive waste materials. And so thorium is, is really, really good at, at reducing the amount of nuclear waste produced. These things can run on their own for a very long time, producing a very large amount of electricity. Okay. So that's really just an introduction. I hope you guys spend some time to do some more research about these different types of nuclear power plants and see that we can actually do so much better than existing nuclear technology. I'd also like you guys to check out about the possibilities of nuclear fusion power plants. There are some really exciting ideas that are being put into practice and some people are trying to make nuclear fusion power plants. And so that's also another exciting development. So we'll see what's going to win out, whether it's going to be things like nuclear, um, with, whether there's going to be things like your liquid fluoride thorium reactors, which have the ability to you know, power the earth forever, or it's going to be things like nuclear fusion. We're going to see what's going to be the most efficient. Anyway, so check it out and do your own research. And thanks for joining me today.